Good evening. Uh, my name is Arthur Urbano, professor of theology at Providence College and chair of the Jewish Catholic Theological Exchange Committee, uh, JCTE for short. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Professor Stephen Long, and on behalf of the JCTE Committee, we would like to welcome all of you zooming in for this evening's dialogue. Uh, the mission of the JCTE is to promote Catholic Jewish engagement and to foster interreligious learning, understanding, and friendship. The JCTE hosts major lectures, colloquia, and other initiatives which provide a forum where members of the Providence College community and the broader Providence Rhode Island community can engage with local religious leaders as well as nationally and internationally recognized experts to discuss themes of mutual religious and historical interest. You can learn more about our work on our website, jewish-catholic.providence.edu, and by following us on Twitter at Jew Jews Catholics PC. If you would like to receive information about future events by email, or you'd like to make a donation to help us continue our work, you can contact me at aurbano at providence.edu. Tonight's discussion is co-sponsored with the Department of History and Classics. Uh, and our topic for tonight is the opening of the Pius XII archives, what's at stake for Jews and Catholics. Pope Pius XII was elected in 1939, just months before the outbreak of World War II, when Germany invaded Poland. Death and destruction engulfed Europe and the Nazis perpetrated one of history's gravest tragedies, a mass genocide against Europe's Jewish population. Through all of this, questions have swirled around the wartime Pope. What did he know about the Holocaust? What did he do? Did he do all he could? Could he have done more? Was he a quiet hero working behind the scenes or silent and indifferent? And are these the only options? These questions have long concerned historians They've also been critical to the interreligious dialogue between Jews and Catholics that has taken shape in the past half century plus. Beginning with Pius's successor, Pope John XXIII, and vigorously promoted by the Pope since then, up to and including Pope Francis. In March 2020, Pope Francis opened the archives on Pius XII, allowing scholars to access and study previously inaccessible documents related to his papacy. Unfortunately, not long after, the archives had to be closed due to the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Our panelists this evening will engage in a dialogue, bringing a Jewish perspective and a Catholic perspective to the various issues the Pius XII archives touch upon. Not only the historical, but also the moral and interreligious relations questions that they raise. There will be time for questions at the end of their conversation, and I invite you to enter your questions in the Q&A box over the course of the evening, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, tonight's event is being recorded and will be available on our website at a later date. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Rabbi David Fox Sandmel is Vice Chair of the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Relations and Senior Advisor on Interreligious Affairs at the Anti-Defamation League. He held the Crown Ryan Chair of Jewish Studies at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago from 2002 to 2014. He was the Jewish Scholar at the Institute for Christian and Jewish Studies in Baltimore and directed the publication of Dabru Amet, a Jewish statement on Christians and Christianity, a statement which incidentally is marking its 20th anniversary this year or last year, well, it's 20th anniversary time. Uh, he lectures and publishes on issues in Jewish-Christian relations, Jewish-Muslim relations, and the foundations of Judaism and Christianity in antiquity. Robert Ventresca is a professor of history at King's University College at Western University, a Roman Catholic liberal arts college in London, Ontario. He is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists, and also serves on the Committee on Ethics, Religion, and the Holocaust at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. His research and teaching are mainly in Holocaust studies and on the role that religion and religious institutions play in conflict and post-conflict transition, reconstruction, and reconciliation. He is the author of Soldier of Christ, The Life of Pius XII, and he is currently writing a book on the Vatican and the Holocaust. 
So welcome to both of you this evening. Um, and I'd just like to get the ball rolling by asking you this question. Can you tell us something about what the archives are, uh, what's in them, uh, and what is it like to do research there? Thank you, David. I'll, thank, I'll start then. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Arthur, for the, uh, and Stephen, thank you for the introduction. Thanks to um, Providence College and to the uh, JCTE uh, for the, uh, the kind invitation. And I'm really delighted to have been able to also work uh, a bit more closely with David um, uh, in preparing for tonight. So, and maybe we'll be able to meet someday, David. I think I don't know that we've actually sort of met, but uh, soon enough, soon enough, I hope. Um, just really quickly, the, the archives, you know, there's so much uh, said about the archives, a lot of mystery around the archives. Um, you know, the archives, the Vatican archives are really um, uh, several archives uh, that essentially are the, I think we should think of them as kind of the central repository of the official records of the, of the, of the, of the Holy See, right? Which again, we don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but we're talking here about sort of the, the central governing authority of the Catholic Church. Uh, so the Vatican archives, again, we use that, that label very, um, very generally, very loosely, but it really is, refers to several archives um, that, again, all of which record the, um, the business of governing the Catholic Church, uh, its internal affairs, uh, but also, and most important, I think, for those of us who are interested in, in Holocaust studies, uh, its relationship with other states, with secular states, uh, and with, if you will, the broader, the broader world. Um, just really, really briefly, again, I don't know how much, David, we want to get into this. I know we, we've gone back and forth a little bit about uh, what, what the archives are like. I, I guess I would just want to say something a little bit about the, um, the, the, the name change. Some people know that there was a name change by Pope Francis in 2019. We, we used to call it the Vatican Secret Archives. Um, and uh, it's now referred to as the Vatican Apostolic Archives. It's very interesting. I mean, um, that word secret is what I think has gotten a lot of people over, over time. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it was in previous centuries made a lot of sense. I think the way to think about that word and to think about these archives is really the way we might say it in, in modern parlance is, is classified. You know, they're, they're the private papers or the classified papers of the, of, the, of the government of the Catholic Church, essentially. And, but the Pope, it's really notable. Pope Francis, um, in the declaration that he made in 2019, changing the name, did address the problem of perception, right? The perception is that to the modern ear, uh, it sounds like the Vatican was sort of up to something nefarious in, in keeping these, these, uh, these papers closed. That actually speaks to, I think, a, a problem and an issue with, uh, with um, the archives, the archives question, why we're here, why we're so excited about the opening of the archives, um, and you know, what we hope that they, um, that they hold. So, um, I mean, I can get into, and maybe we'll have a chance, I think, to, to go back to that a little bit further, but I guess I, I, would, uh, I would start there. David, did you, I mean, I'm wondering what you, what you are curious about in terms of the archives. Well, I'm, you know, as, as, as someone who's done some research in my life, I'm interested in what it's like to, to, to work in the archives. I, I, so I, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Um, I would just uh, confirm that the, the, not so much the, the name uh, about the secret, but, but the fact that the, the archives and specifically the archives of Pope Pius XII were closed um, has been a point of contention in Jewish Catholic relations, um, uh, certainly since, since I've been involved. And, you know, we, uh, I'm involved with the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations. We meet regularly with the uh, uh, Vatican's Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. We have very good relations with the commission, uh, not only on the professional level, but, on, but even on the personal level. I was on a call earlier this week with, with Cardinal Koch. That having been said, every time we met, it was important for us to bring up the question about the archives. And in, until uh, now that they have been opened, I think it's kind of taken that off the agenda. And the, the, the problem was, and this is what I think you were saying, it was the appearance of um, withholding information. Uh, it, it seemed to be a lack of transparency. And so I think that, that um, uh, this, you know, the opening is a very significant moment in the ongoing relationship between the Catholic Church and, 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 and the Jewish people. 
um, it's um, I would say it's the perhaps the beginning of a new phase, but that phase is going to take a long time. And I think you can you can probably speak to that as the the, the historian with expertise in this area and in the in the archives themselves. That's it's really helpful to uh, to re to remember why we you know why so much attention has been paid to these archives and why the opening of the archives generated such uh, such excitement. Um, because as you say, I mean, for decades, really, it has been a stumbling block. Uh, it's been a stumbling block, I think you would say, I mean, you know, your expertise and your experience, especially in the dialogue and in relational aspects. From the historian's perspective, of course, uh, we did have a considerable amount of documentation. Uh, people may know that beginning in 1965, at Pope Paul VI, uh, behest, uh, select documents from the pious archives were uh, published, edited and published by a team of Jesuit uh, scholars. Uh, I think it comes to about 11 volumes altogether, which I used for my book on Pius XII, which are very, very rich sources, but they are select, right? They're, they're uh, impartial, they're, they're partial, they're fragmentary, they're incomplete. Um, and so there's really, there's sort of two tracks as it were, and maybe they, they ran parallel, maybe at some point they met. The, the, the simple problem, I mean, it really is a lack of transparency. And from the historian's perspective, it's not as if archives give us all of the answers but there were just so many gaps in the record uh, and there probably will still be, right? But because no, no archive is ever complete as it were, but there's a real problem of actually understanding fully what happened, why, uh, what's behind the Pope's choices, decisions and so forth, because the historical record was, was fragmentary. That then reflects also the obstacle uh, on, on the level of dialogue and relations, right? So those two issues which are distinct Nevertheless, were um, I think you know obviously really closely related. Um, just really quickly, Brad, as you were asking about how what it's like to to you know to research in the archives, it's it's kind of um, it's not it's it's not nearly as mysterious in lots of ways. You know, um, it's a very sort of as you as you know, it's very sort of like other archives. One has to ask for permission. It's a bit officious. You know, one has to present documents well in advance. Um, it, you know, there is, it's highly restrictive policy, so usually one has to have some kind of institutional affiliation uh, or recommendation. Certainly you have to sort of show that you have a project and this is what you're going to, you know, what you're going to do with it. Um, and of course it is something, you know, it's, it's located in the, the archives that I'm particularly interested in, the collections that I'm interested in, tucked away uh, in behind uh, um, St. Peter's Square there in Vatican City. Uh, but other than that, I mean, the reading room is a fairly, it's a, it's uh, some of you can certainly find this pictures of it on the on, online, a fairly conventional um, approach. In other words, you know, one gets in there, one requests documents, they arrive. Um, there, I think there's going to be some talk and some, some work possibly around digitization at some point, although I think we're, we're a long ways from, from all of that. But it's, some, it's an interesting experience. Uh, it's, uh, it can be somewhat more challenging than other archives. Um, in the sense of uh, processes, maybe a little slower, um, but I have to say that they have been streamlined considerably in the last few years. So things definitely are getting a lot easier uh, in terms of access. I think maybe um, uh, some folks would be interested in, in your answer to, to this question, if I may, and that is um, not all of the archives of the church are in the apostolic archives, or even in Rome, especially those relating to the, the, the Second World War. So again, in terms of expectations, um, there are smaller archives scattered over sort of the world, not only, I suppose, in, in um, various, you know, uh, uh, diocesan archives, but even, you know, this monastery or that convent and, you know, so, yep. There's an incredible mass of material, yeah. and I met, I would imagine a lot of that that material is not even necessarily cataloged and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, for sure, for sure, and that's really useful. Again, it's important, I think, and maybe helpful for people to remember. Um, again, these are institutional archives, the Vatican archives. They are uh, they really are. Um, they will give us uh, the what we really need to know about how the, the central governing organs, the central government of the church uh, acted, reacted in the time of, in this context, war and, and genocide. Um, but as you say, I mean, if one thinks about other church archives, um, 
I mean, the sky's the limit. There are there are diocesan archives, there are parish archives at a, at a local level. Um, the, the, the one of the religious orders is a very interesting one, for example, convents, monasteries, for example, because we know in, in the case of uh, the Holocaust, um, of just as one example, some of the, the work that was done on the part of female religious orders around uh, rescue um, of, of Jewish children, orphans, uh, which in itself, of course, is fraught with all kinds of issues uh, around rescue, rescue conversion and what happens uh, after. But that story, which is also a part of the institutional history, because those religious orders are part of the institutional Catholic Church, yeah, those archives are everywhere. Um, so what, what you can get from the Vatican archives is, and what I, for example, I'm looking for is what kind of communication was there between, say, the center, and let's call it the periphery, just for lack of a better word, right? But that's one of the levels of analysis that, that these archives can, can help you to get at. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ultimately they, they are, as I said before, they're state papers. So you're gonna, you know, you're gonna really get a glimpse into the, the way in which the Vatican uh, makes its decisions, who are the key actors, what kind of information do they have? What do they, what do, they do with the information that they're getting? Again, especially say in the time of crisis and war. Um, and then how do they reason their way to the decisions that they, that they make? Uh, decisions which for the most part we know, right? That's a part of the historical record that is known to us as it were. What we, what we need to get a better sense of is, okay, what's really going on behind the scenes? But yeah, I mean, you know, there are private archives, personal papers, Catholic organizations, Catholic dissenters, thinkers, a, a really rich array, a dizzying array uh, of, of potential sources there. Um, we're, 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 we're sort of in this part of the program where, where, where Rob knows what he's talking about and, and, and I don't. Um, <laughs> my expertise will come in in, in, in a moment, I, I, I hope. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the archives were opened uh, a, just a little bit more than a year ago and then COVID set in, which, which clearly uh, limited uh, access. Um, uh, when were you last there, by the way? Well, I was there last uh, summer, it was 2000 and, if I remember now, this was 2019, I guess. 2019, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there have been some articles uh, written about things that have been discovered so far. Um, it, uh, uh, are there any, is there anything that you think is particularly momentous um, or, or is it all premature? Yeah, I mean, I think it's premature. I'd be curious to know what, <laughs> what, your, what your take is uh, as well. I, I think it's premature for obvious reasons. Um, you know, the danger is, David, and, and again, I'd really be curious to know how you feel about this also in the context of the, of the, the broader challenge. And we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about this um, in terms of your own work. Uh, you know, what are sort of the challenges for dialogue and, and for for Jewish Catholic relations. But I think one of the dangers is sensationalism, which this topic um, just seems to constantly, perennially, decade after decade, garner. Um, you know, uh, and again, feel free please, to you know, jump in with your own, you know, your own impressions on this. But what I worry about sometimes is a, is a rush to judgment. You know, I guess they call it in the, it's the social media world, the clickbait mode, uh, the gotcha moment, you know, and that, that's, that's problematic, right? From a historical perspective of evaluation, because we just, that's not how it works. We need time and whatnot. But it, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I worry that it can impair and impede again, the dialogue, right? When we move from the question of historical judgments to relations and a dialogue. So that's my, my immediate thought of that. I, I can ask, we get more specific about some about particular questions, but curious to know what you thought. Well, I, I think, um, first of all, I, um, uh, I share your concern about sensationalism and about jumping to, to conclusions. Um, this is, uh, I think you may have used the word as well, this is a very fraught topic. And it's um, not only fraught, I believe, between the Jewish community and the Catholic community, but I think internally within the Catholic Church, it, it's fraught as well. And again, you could probably speak better to that than, than I can, or perhaps Arthur uh, as as well. But you know the the um, the danger with something that where it is so fraught and where you know there are 
um, it's almost as if they're they're sort of teams, right? They're they're those who are absolutely sure that that and, and both Jews and Catholics yep. absolutely sure that 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 Pius was a great hero, yep. and then the and then the flip side, and of course that binary, um, you know, good bad also disturbs me because I don't think anything historically is well, but perhaps one or two exceptions, uh, it, it works out to be, yeah. you know, in that, that, that clear cut. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that in, in terms of the dialogue, um, uh, getting a better sense of what happened, why things happened, I think is very important. Um, but as you said, we're not gonna know everything. Um, and, you know, if you look at the literature that's already out there, it's all over the place. And it's hard for me to imagine that the interpretations of the materials are also not going, you know, perhaps there will be a, a, a more uh, generally recognized consensus will, will emerge, but people bring to their research their own uh, biases and perhaps their own desire to prove their pre, <laughs> their prejudgments. Um, the other, you know, the, we're, we're talking specifically here about the, uh, the archives of Pius the, the, the 12th and, and um, uh, I guess, you know, I think that, that Pius, um, the Pope Pius um, has been, had placed on his shoulders in a sense, not only sort of the responsibilities for what he did or didn't do as the head of the the church, but in a, in a certain extent, um, um, he has become, I think that the, the, uh, the emblem, you know, of what the church either did or didn't do. And, and by extension, and this is completely unfair, but I think it, it, it's reality, he's sort of become the emblem of what the Christian world writ large did. And so, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, if we can figure out did he or didn't he, somehow we are going to have a key to this whole thing. And, and, and that I, I think is, it would be nice, but I think it's unrealistic. And, and uh, again, I'm not defending Pope Pius, uh, but I think it's important just from the, the, the you know, as, as, as historians that we are, you know, uh, fair when, when, we, when we deal with this. The, the other thing, and maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but, but that is um, how what happened during the war years plays out with contemporary Jewish Catholic uh, relations. And, and again, I, I think that, that this is going to require patience on both sides. You're, you're hearing, I think, a lot of themes running through here. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, but the, the the you know how do how does the church react if something particularly damning comes out, right? What is the responsibility of the church today, vis-a-vis -vis things that happened you know 70, 75, 80 years ago, um, or or perhaps you know even longer than that. Um, and, and uh, how we navigate that, um, you know, how the church responds to things come out, how the Jewish community responds, how we talk about this together, um, how we ensure that, uh, that this is seen to some extent as, as a joint project that we're working on together. Um, you know, now maybe, maybe that would require Convene, you know, and, and this has happened in the past with 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 some success and not, you know, but bring together a, a, a team to do some of this work, um, uh, you know. So it's not so it's not like our side and your side, and then we bring our conclusions and we try to fight it out. But if you know, if if, if it's something that scholars work on together, I think there's a better chance of um, uh, of of uh, finding conclusions that are generally agreed upon. Okay. Yeah, that's a really interesting, uh, that reminds me of the, of course, of the work of the Joint uh, Commission um, you alluded to before, uh, uh, 
which term, finished its work in 2000, right? The, the report was produced in, in October, I think, of 2000. That was that the commission that looked at the published documents. Um, there were three Catholic scholars, three Jewish scholars who looked at the published documents, um, realized we got a lot of un, unanswered questions here, and then and asked for access to the unopened portions of the archives. And of course, we're, we're, uh, we're rebuffed at that at that point. Um, there's a lot there. I mean, I don't, again, I don't, and I don't, I'll, I'll ask it, and, um, but I'm curious whether you feel comfortable maybe, um, what are, what do you think, you, you, there's two things I'm really curious about. Um, the, the one is, you, you mentioned the role that Pius XII has taken in all of this, right? The, the weight on, on what is the responsibility is what that's put on his shoulders. Why do you think that is? Because it might be a useful way for us to, um, to, to get at why the question of the Vatican and the Vatican archives matters. You know, the title that you helped us with this evening, what's at stake, you know, other than the inherent interest and relevance and importance of the topic. One of the things we want to tease out tonight is why this matters, right, in, especially in the world of interfaith uh, and interreligious relations. Why do you think it is um, that Pius XII is made to wear this, this responsibility? Well, I think some of it simply has to do with the way uh, people who perhaps aren't that familiar with the church think about the role of the Pope, right? right. And uh, you know, even concepts that are generally misunderstood like papal infallibility. You know, um, uh, you know, which would I, you know, would some think you know the Pope never makes a mistake when when he figures out the tip if he's ever at a restaurant. You know what I mean? Uh, um, uh, just a general misunderstanding of the nature of 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 the papacy. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, I mean, I think there's a general tendency to look at the person in charge, and you know, to say. They are responsible, and and uh, uh, of course, when we're dealing with the Second World War, when we're dealing with the Holocaust, this is an incredibly, uh, un understandably, an incredibly emotional uh, uh, and and uh, deeply felt issue within the Jewish community. Um, you know, the there is certainly, um, uh, you know, historically, I think. Uh, uh, most people agree that the history of the, and here I'm going to say the Christian church, but it, for most of that time, it, you know, the, the Catholic church was very significant um, in, in sort of laying the groundwork for what happened during the Holocaust. That's, a, that's, that's significant. And, and I, I think it's a, uh, pretty sure it was Gene Fisher, but others who have said, you know, the, the teaching, the Catholic teacher, the Christian teaching of contempt was a necessary but insufficient um, uh, contributor or cause for the Holocaust. Um, so how we understand that, and, and I think especially from the, the, the perspective of the Jewish community, you know, we look at, um, we look at Nostra Aetate, we look at the other documents, and uh, by and large, I mean, we can critique each of them and we could perhaps talk about the, the, some of the issues in the We Remember document. But I think broadly we see, a, a, at least my view is that we see a church that is um, uh, attempting to confront its own past that wants to chart a very different uh, direction in its relationship with the Jewish community. Um, and this is, um, an issue that gives people pause and um, it makes people question, um, uh, you know, uh, are they sincere? Do they mean it? Can, can we trust them? Are they really our friends? Yeah. If something else happens, you know, are, are, will, will we see different behavior assuming again that, that that's re required? Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a new relationship uh, comparatively. I mean, 1965 is a, a while ago, but in the terms of Jewish Christian relations, it's, a, it's just yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, are the changes real? Um, you know, I was involved in, in, in 
in, in the production of Dabru Ahmed. And I remembered I was, uh, and this was 20 years ago, um, but I was asked by a significant Jewish leader about the document is but the comment was, do you think they really deserve it? Meaning, do the Christians deserve what was being said in Dabru Ahmed? And this was not a, you know, this is this was not a naive person mm -hmm. asking the question. It was a it was a real question. Um, and again, the the um, as I'm speaking and I think about it, I have you know the, the relationships that I have with people in the Catholic Church are um, mostly either professional or, or 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 professional that have become personal, um, um, and um, uh, what is it that I want to say here? The the um, these relationships aren't the same as the church. And I think it's the church that uh, many, at least in the Jewish community, uh, want to make sure is owning the past, is acknowledging the past. And again, we don't know what, some people think they know what that is. I think we don't know exactly what that is. But, um, uh, uh, and again, this is this comes back to what I think this challenge is between what happened in the 30s and 40s and how today uh, the church responds to whatever's going to be coming up. Right. Yeah. So it comes back to, I guess, the central question of, of power. Right. I think one of the one of the one of the reasons why we come back again and again to the question of Pius XII and the question of the Vatican, what it did or did not do in the time of war and genocide is because we want to know uh, what the foremost spiritual power authority of the Christian world at the time, what he, what he did with this power, right? Uh, and I, I thought your point about misunderstanding or, or, or not quite grasping the, the nature of the papacy to the extent that anybody really does, because itself that's a contested uh, concept, but that's important, right? Because it may very well be that in the end, um, our judgment, our evaluation of his exercise of power, right? Or his failure to act or, or um, may actually be based on a misunderstanding of what that, that power actually is. Um, I'm wondering, over before we turn to talk about what's at stake in Jewish Catholic relations, um, could we maybe just really briefly um, just summarize, I guess, especially for the benefit of students who, who, will, who will be listening, what some of the issues are. You know, um, our colleagues John Roth and Carol Rittner have, have described this years ago as the unsettled and unsettling questions. What are some of those questions? Maybe we can very, very briefly back and forth together, come up with what we think are some of the unsettled and unsettling questions about the Vatican, about the Holocaust, before the Second World War, during and after that, um, that these archives are gonna help us to get at. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a few in my mind. I'm curious to know, for example, what for you would be one of the big unsettled questions, maybe the big unsettled question. Well, I think one of them is, uh, uh, and this I think was the title of the, the film that's making the rounds right now, Ho Holy Silence. Right. Um, uh, why didn't the Pope and perhaps others speak out uh, more forcefully? At, or let me rephrase it, speak out at all, right? right? Um, I think that that's, that's a huge question. Um, then there, I think there are also questions about um, whether there were any directives from Rome to the broader church saying, you know, to the extent that you can without exposing yourself, do what you, you know, try to help the Jews and others who were being persecuted. Uh, was there any, any effort to mobilize the church sent from, 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 from Rome. We know that in different, uh, in different locations, lot, you know, individuals um, uh, took a lot of initiative, but what were the, what were the directions? And, you know, and I asked, again, he asked those questions and um, one has to keep, one has to contextualize them, of course, in, in, in the period of time. I think one of the things is, Again, we have to be careful about retrojecting not only our 2021 values, but also our 2021, you know, pardon me, 2021 hindsight is 2020 vision. Um, and and uh, I mean, again, I, I, I'm, I, I wanna be clear that I'm not arguing one point or the other. I'm really 
make it, trying to make the point that whatever we come up with has to be historically methodologically sound yeah and and um that's why i think the rut you know the the, the we have to be careful about the rush to yes, exactly. to find the answer yeah. and i i guess you know um uh, uh, what you know what did pious actually do and and this is not my own formulation it might actually have been yours from from this fall but um you know what did he do what actually could he have done given the various circumstances and then perhaps what should he have done yeah and, and that's I mean, yeah, sorry yeah that's and that's just immediately brings me to, to to this i guess the central dilemma which will always be that in a way the question is there's that plane of historical judgment, historical evaluation, right? And these archives are absolutely vital for us to be able to answer some of those basic questions about what did he do or what, what did he know and when did he know it and uh, all of that. But the other questions about what he could have done and especially what he should have done, those are questions of a more of a moral and an ethical nature, which I, I don't think any, I don't think these archives can answer it, no archive can really answer. So uh, again, even for the benefit of, 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 the, of, our, of our guests and of students who may be listening, I think that's one of the big questions which probably just never, never goes away because it's the perennial question about what does this man who exercises power and authority, and remember he has considerable uh, authority within his institution, and he has influence in the world, right? We can debate how much influence a pope has in the world, especially the non-Catholic world, or even over the Catholic world. But I think it always comes back to that fundamental question. What did the successor of Peter, what did, what did the vicar of Christ on earth do with his power uh, in the face of uh, extreme grave humanitarian crises and I mean, mass murder, right? That's that question. So that to me is a fundamental, it's a historical question, but it's of course always a moral and an ethical question about what we think um, should have been done. And I think that, that, um, that, will, that will persist. I might just add to those questions, David, that you know, the other issue for the historian to, to um, explore in these archives is what happens in the immediate aftermath of the war. So as you know, questions about the fate of Jewish orphans, uh, we've seen some early reporting and some early research there about Jewish children who had been to Jewish child survivors. Um, whether they were orphans or not is, is, an, is an, it's a contested issue, but uh, what did the Vatican know about their numbers, about their location, about their fate? What did the Vatican do to help uh, when Jewish authorities were asking for, for these uh, survivors to be returned to family or to Jewish communities? Of course, for the, for the Jewish world, of course, it's a matter of survival, existential, uh, spiritual, as well as, as, uh, as you know, community survival. Uh, there are some troubling other questions about the immediate post-war. You know, um, very high level, even papal interventions on behalf of, uh, of individuals uh, of the Nazi fascist order um, in terms of clemency appeals. Those are some troubling questions. Um, at the same time, you know, there are ways in which uh, the Pope, both during the war and after the war, uh, is pushing forward uh, a vision of what we would sort of describe today as a human rights regime, you know, criticizing, um, you know, the excessive power of the state of any government uh, you know, to perpetuate crimes against citizens, whether it's own citizens or, or citizens of another country. You know, uh, these are aspects that are, are, I think, lesser known. But again, you know, you, you really get a sense of the, of some of the stark contradictions um, that we have to work out. And again, I don't know that the archives will, will provide us with, with easy answers or ready answers, but we need them, right? Because without, without at least an opportunity to study them fully, uh, a lot of those open questions are going to remain uh, just impossible to at least attempt to get some grasp of, uh, on historically. So I, I hope that's useful as a general survey. I, I, I made a note that, that we haven't yet mentioned the word beatification. Aha, okay, let's put that on the, <laughs> that might be a good pivot for us because right? now we can, we can sort of be talking again and we'll have a chance to, QA to, to discuss further some of the uh, historical issues and questions people may have. Um, now, Jewish-Catholic relations, and now we're really moving into your, your ballywick, as it were. So, um, uh, you know, if I may sort of take the lead here, um, I, I'm, I guess there's lots of questions that I have. Um, let me start with what I think is, um, you know, you would, 
you've said to me before that you know Jewish leaders have uh, welcomed the opening of these archives and see it as a very uh, you know obviously a positive step long awaited I think we've waited unnecessarily long what do you see as some of the um, you know issues dilemmas that remain both on a, on a, on the level of the historical and ethical judgment of this issue particularly right which is the church's role in in response to the Holocaust that's one issue but also then the connection there to the state of, of Jewish Catholic relations and dialogue and interfaith relations and dialogue more generally. Well, I think, um, to, to put it bluntly, I think one of the questions is um, to what extent is the church today ready to own, in a sense, what occurred during that period of time? Um, and um, uh, and uh, you know, um, and this goes back to when you know when something when something disturbing pops up as it you know comes out of the archives, as I'm sure it will. You know, how do they respond specifically? How does, but but more generally, how does how does the church uh, uh, acknowledge appropriately um, uh, the role that it did play? Um, people look at the document we remember, um, and even the the note that that uh, Pope John Paul II placed in the uh, uh, in the in the wall in the Western Wall in Jerusalem, both of which um, seem to leave a little bit of space, or perhaps a lot of space, between the Church and what occurred during the Second World War. Um, you know, the, I think uh, um, we remember talks about, uh, you know, sort of a pagan ideology. Um, I think some, uh, I think uh, critics both in the Jewish community and the Catholic community were, were looking for an acknowledgement of a, uh, 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 of a closer connection. Yep. Um, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, between sort of the history, again, I mentioned this earlier, the history of the teaching of contempt and and what emerged dur during the, the war. Um, that seemed to be, you know, and again, they, the note that John Paul II put in the in the wall talked about sons and daughters of, of, of the church. Um, now, again, here, this is another point of, I think, some perhaps misunderstanding or, or contention between Jews and, and Catholics, and that is that uh, Jews generally, when they don't hear the word church as a theological concept, when they hear it as an institutional concept. And I think in the Catholic world, it's both, right? right? So um, that's something that I think needs greater um, uh, uh, consideration in, in, in both communities. Um, you know, there, there's, um, uh, I think, and, and again, help me with this if I'm, if I'm mistaken, that, you know, the, the church as a theological concept, in a sense, by definition, can't do anything wrong. Um, the church as an institution can, right, which is why we see some of you know some of the things that are going on now uh, uh, on, on on a variety of levels, whether it, it uh, has to do with 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 abuse or finances or or, or whatever. Um, but I think that that uh, I think that that's something. Again, I'm coming back to to how does the church today own its past yeah. uh, in a way that convinces folks who might be leery about sincerity and, and um, uh, real self-examination will say, yeah, you know, they've, they, they've done that hard work. Now, I would say that some of that hard work has definitely been done. Um, um, and again, the, the, uh, the Jewish community is far from monolithic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's you know I, I want to be sure that it's not as if the, the 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 church has to convince the Jewish community because in a sense in that regard there you know there isn't 
the Jewish community. There are many different sub communities. These are the things that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I um, concept of sort of truth and reconciliation <laughs> uh, uh, co comes to mind. And although I'm careful about uh, 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 mixing again, mixing context. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about reconciliation, it seems, in Jewish Catholic relations, but the truth part may have been, and I, and I share with you, we don't want to just, we don't want to mix concepts and processes from other, other contexts, but that's what we're getting at again. We come back to these archives, why they matter. Do we have a truth, the, the, the full picture? You know, when Francis opened the archives, he said that the church is not afraid of history. And yet, you know, we know that, I mean, this is, I think, was, was always the, the problem of, of until archives are fully open and accessible, you don't really have that transparency. And without that transparency, you can't really have accountability. You can't do that hard work. You can't do that hard history as some people, you know, that, that, that truth telling, truth seeking and truth telling, right? I'll adopt concepts from other, con uh, uh, phrase from other contexts. And that may be an interesting reflection on where things stand. We, there, there, there has clearly been radical transformations in Jewish Catholic relations. There have been radical transformations in Catholic teachings after uh, Vatican II. Um, but, but it's, it, in some senses, perhaps, I'm, I'm just gonna venture this as an observation, it's, it rests on some, some, maybe some shaky ground, foundations because the truth telling uh, and the truth seeking isn't, isn't there yet. And I, I, you, you asked this really good question and I, I've been thinking about it, you know, is the church, again, the Catholic church is not monolithic either, but is institutionally, is the papacy, for example, prepared you know to to practice what it preaches when it says it's not afraid of history you know um and you know i think you you mentioned we remember you mentioned john paul ii's um, statement from in jerusalem and they sort of point to a troubling um unwillingness on some level at that highest level to acknowledge papal responsibility right hence the language about sons and daughters of the church it's a, it's a it's a rhetorical tactic in a way, right? To avoid the hard question of papal accountability and papal responsibility, right? Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where, that, where that's going to go, but uh, I hope that, that, we, you know, that they practice what they preach in that sense, but we'll see. Well, maybe maybe uh, Pope Francis's comment was, was aspirational. Aspirational, let's put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and again, there are other historical, other historical uh, cases of historical and contemporary abuse and injustice on the part of institutional Catholicism. And again, the issue of transparency, accountability, truth seeking, those, the, the moral reckoning. I mean, those are, those are, again, I'm a historian, so I'll stay in my lane as it were. Uh, but one of the things that, that, you know, that, you know, successive popes have said is that we've got to get the historical record right, or we at least have to establish it, you know, in, in as detailed and rich a way as we can before you can proceed to those moral, ethical, and theological judgments, debates, um, and reflections, as it were. So but we can't do that until we get the access to the archives, which is why this is such a historic uh, opportunity. It's a generational opportunity, really. Well, then there, there's the, the, uh, another question, which has to do with, um, you know, let's assume that, um, in X number of years, every scrap of paper has been, um, you know, uh, read and parsed, and and we have a, a multi-volume definitive history. And uh, scholars like you and people involved in deeply involved in interreligious relations like me uh, know about this stuff. Um, how does it get out? Right, and this is a, this is a um, it's not only a question about this particular issue, but this is something that we talk about uh, a lot when when uh, it, in our dialogues uh, uh, with the with the you know the Jewish Catholic dialogues is you know we we've um, uh, I know I mentioned we've got wonderful personal relationships with yes. with uh, um, uh, people in Rome and in other parts of the church. Um, uh, but we know, I mean, I know from experience that even American Catholics, and I would say even people teaching in, uh, in like Catholic high schools don't necessarily know about Nostra Aetate. Right. Um, or the subsequent documents. Uh, 
Uh, and this is also a problem in seminary education and so forth. And I would say it's also a problem in Jewish education. You know, I think a lot of people in the Jewish community uh, 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 still conceive of the Christian world as it was, you know, before 1945. You know, so um, I think one of the biggest challenges will, will, will be um, making sure that this information is disseminated and, and, and taught. And again, so it becomes, um, uh, again, not, not simply the, the provenance of, 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 a, of a, you know, a few of us people who write about this stuff, but you know, really gets into the, down, down to the, the street level, the parish level in a sense. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure that that is uh, a challenge for the church on on many many levels, not just on this one. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's uh, you know I think you and I talked a little bit about uh, previously about the concerns around sort of an echo chamber effect when it comes to the, the world of dialogue, you know, and we've taken it almost maybe we've um, you know taken too much comfort over the past few decades that you know Nostra Etate came and it changed things. And I, I will offer just very a very brief personal reflection because I was educated in Catholic schools here in Ontario in the 1970s and 80s and. and um, and I, I think I, as I reflect on that education, it was definitely, uh, I, could, I see how it, bro it, the it bore the fruits and the, the signs of Vatican II, because we were given very positive understandings of the relationships of the Jewish origins of the church and so on and so forth. What's missing from my preparation that education, however, was an understanding of that complex snarled history that comes before it. That snarled mix of theology, teaching of contempt, which mixes with so social, economic, political, cultural factors. So there's this, again, there's an interesting sort of um, almost a kind of a dissonance, you know, um, fragmented memory. And we have these, you know, fragments of, of, of transformation in this relationship. But, but again, there's maybe not enough of an understanding of why the Nostritate was necessary, uh, what it did, what it, what it failed to do. Right? which is again a difficult question uh, we often talk about celebrating it um, and again I'm not a theologian and, but but it's something that is really important I think in the Catholic world to start to um, have a very frank conversation a self-critical self-aware reflection on um, on where we stand in terms of our understanding of this long history the um, the more immediate more proximate questions of the Holocaust and what it what it means for Catholics and Jews um, and then what it means for the world of relations and dialogue today and, and tomorrow, especially in a world where, as we know, you know, rising tides of, of anti-Semitism, the return of anti-Semitism as a political factor in many, many parts of the world, including in North America. Um, so the, um, you know, the, 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 it's an urgent matter. Right? It's not just a matter of, of historical interest or historical record as much as I, of course, am committed to making sure we, we try to establish that in, in the first place. So. Well, I, I um, and this is perhaps a bit of a tangent, but I, I would like to think that, um, uh, first of all, that, that what has transpired between Jews and Catholics in the last two generations, perhaps might uh, uh, say something about the potential for uh, Sort of rebooting relationships we were thinking about. and and dealing with 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 difficult pasts. I, I you know I, I I don't want to go too far with that, but I think that this uh, has the potential to be uh, in a sense a, a model for how communities can um, uh, can move past very difficult times. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, as 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 much as there are are serious questions that still are are to be resolved, I think that there are some important things in the Jewish Catholic relationship that that could be instructive, and this has the potential really to to move that to a different level. So we're so we're at a, a, again an inflection point of a kind, and it's it's an opportunity to revisit, to renew, to recommit. Right? Um, we may be getting, uh, yeah, we've got some questions coming in. So perhaps we can, David, do we have any other comments or questions before we? Well, I, um, uh, go on, of course. I just wonder if, I, if, if we should take a, a minute on the beatification issue. Oh, sure, okay. <laughs> um, just, um, uh, because um, I think that, that 
um, in a certain way that that is also sort of emblematic right. uh, and, and it also a very complicated issue yeah. um, uh, you know the it the uh, uh, Pope Pius led the the church during a very difficult time yeah um, and uh, uh, clearly um, is beloved by a lot of people um, the move to uh, uh, to beatify him, as you can, you know, as, as I'm sure people can well imagine, was not well received in the Jewish community. It was seen, it was seen as, as um, uh, well, by those who had already judged Pius, it was seen as completely uh, uh, unjustified. And for those who um, felt that the, the, you know, we didn't have all of the information, it was seen, seen as premature. Absolutely. And and um, uh, and was taken by some, I think, as as a, sort of a slap in the a slap in the face. Yeah. See, that's something that doesn't happen when you're. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's something that doesn't happen when you're lecturing in, in person. Unless you forget to turn off your phone. So uh, you know, I I, I and and. Um, uh, and I think then there are those in the Catholic community who feel, first of all, that it's none of the Jews' business who the church beatifies. And, it, you know, I mean, there are something to be said about internal religious issues. And yet it does have, uh, you know, it does have implications. It does have ramifications. So that's a very difficult, um, a very difficult issue. It is beatification of Edith Stein uh, also was a very difficult issue. Um, and I know that there had been some conversations about, uh, or at least a move to beatify, I think it was Cardinal Holland of, of um, uh, I, I don't think that's moving, going anywhere quickly, but just to make the point that um, uh, these, you know, uh, the, the beatification of people who had some involvement in the church during that period of time is again something that the Jewish community is going to sit up and take notice of. You know, we we uh, Jewish community doesn't generally pay that much attention to who's um, uh, you know in process perhaps towards beatification, <laughs> but there are a few that um, you know they're they're in our Google search or whatever, and they, they pop up and they get people's attention, and 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 it raises the quest all of the questions that we've been talking about. It raises them all again. Well, because it must feel like a provocation of a kind, and again, I I appreciate that people. Um, of good conscience can disagree on the issue of beatification even within the church. I mean, I'm gonna speak as a historian and as a Catholic, I have a problem with beatifying, I mean, popes in general, um, but the, 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 there are, there, there's a practical question on one hand, because when you, when you move to beatify, for example, um, you, know, you, you start to condition and frame the historical record that can inhibit our ability to have a very frank uh, assessment, historical evaluation of, the, of, these, of these actors. But, but you know, beyond that, there is a concern that I have that we that there is a search for what we might call, and I think it's been, it's been described for other, other instances in the Christian world, the search for redemptive narratives, right? If we've got to find Catholic heroes of the Holocaust, uh, and I mean, if we can make the Pope a Catholic hero of the Holocaust, all the better. And the, the, in many cases, again, let's say that there are people whose act, actions in, in the Holocaust is you know merits designations like righteous among the Gentiles merits for those who are are, are concerned about beatification that uh, recognition. Um, but the problem, what I worry about again, comes back to this problem of history, remembrance, uh, selective memory, forgetting, uh, and it, you know the, the the danger is that if we search and we and if we if we highlight these redemptive narratives, which are as important as they are. We lose sight of some of the, again, the more important, more central questions about how and why the Holocaust happened, what role Catholic teaching played in that, what role the papacy and Catholic institutions played in responding to Nazism and fascism, uh, and so forth. Right. So that's that's a concern. It's an abiding concern that I have. Uh, again, as a historian and, and someone who happens also to be Catholic. Um, so. To be continued on that question, but 
Um, we can maybe now, so I think we've got some questions coming in and I'm not sure if Stephen or there's Arthur, there he is. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks both for uh, that conversation and sort of presenting to us the, the sort of the various dimensions of, of this conversation historically, the moral questions that arise, um, and then also um, it, it's, it's a, I mean, in, in a way, it, the, this is a shared issue between, between Jews uh, and Catholics, and I, and I uh, appreciate the way that you've um, brought that out. So I want to uh, invite our audience uh, to uh, put any questions that you have in the Q&A, and we'll go through those. Um, I, I just want to, and as those questions are coming in, if, if I, if sort of as the host, could sort of take advantage of, of this moment and, and ask my own question. Um, so, you know, the question that arises of, you know, could Pius have done more uh, to, to either in speaking out against Hitler, uh, in speaking out against whatever was known to him uh, about the Holocaust at the time, um, is a question that we kind of um, look at as a, a, a sort of a contemporary question looking back. Is there any evidence that at the time itself, uh, there were people, say, within the church um, that were raising the question then, uh, so that it's what well, it may not just be a question we ask now, but is there is is there anything that points to this was a question being asked at that time? Sure. Um, that's for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A short answer, Arthur, is yes. Um, there were, yes, short answer. <laughs> Should I elaborate a bit? I mean, I, I discussed this a little bit in the book too. Even as early as 1939, I mean, uh, you know, there are, there's a, you know, the French um, thinker, Emmanuel Mounier, for example, who's an early critic of, of Pacelli's uh, caution. Let's, I, I'll try to be diplomatic, I guess, in a way, but there was an early Catholic critique of um, the privileging of the diplomatic approach, right? Uh, and we got, I want to be, you know, how much into the weeds we, we can get into in the little time that we have, but I, I'm not one of these who thinks that the popes, you know, that using papal diplomacy was abdicating moral responsibility because the papal diplomats saw their, their role, saw the exercise of diplomacy as exercising their mission and their, and their, their ministry. So, but that meant choosing a certain approach it meant choosing a certain response to the actions of states like Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, right? So when, when Italy invades Albania in April of 1939, Good Friday as it happens, there's silence, quote unquote. And, and there is already a, from, from the, the, the outset of, of, of this Pope's pontificate, a critique of that approach, right? And it continues. It continues throughout. And um, again, some of it is, is maybe more stringent the, the, and, and a little sharper. But um, so, yeah, it's there. And the, 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 the crux of it really is ultimately the Pope, um, you know, wears many hats, no pun intended. Um, there are different dimensions to the papal office and to the papal role. Um, and so this public vocal teaching role, if we want to call it that, that office, um, perhaps was um, underestimated, was silenced. That's, that I think is, a, is an issue both for historical judgment and then beyond that for whatever moral, theological or ecclesiological judgment someone might make. So I don't know if that, that helps Arthur. Yeah, no, it does, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'll hand things over to, uh, to, to Stephen now and um, he can sort of guide us through uh, the audience questions. So, uh, Arthur, can you remind me if I hit this button, answer live, does that uh, make the question visible for everyone? I think that's how it works. All right. Um, so, uh, one question here. I um, uh, hope that comes up by uh, Robert Lando. I hope that's the right way to say your name. Um, asking just um, uh, starting with uh, the length of um, the time that it took to uh, open these. And uh, I think maybe we'll start with the second part of his question. Is there a standard policy as to how long after a Pope serves his archives will be available for review? And uh, maybe that gets at the first part of his question. So why did it take so long to open these archives? Yeah, uh, I'll take that, I guess. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's 75 years, as I recall, from the, from the end of a pontificate. I think it's sort of the standard rule, but of course, exceptions are made. 
Um, and in fact, an exception was made by Paul VI when he began uh, and authorized the select, uh, the editing and the select publication of uh, the Pius uh, archives, which I mean, started in 1939, let's say Pius XII was Pope until 1958. What was published, of course, in those 11 volumes is mainly the war years. So I think they go up to 1946, 47, maybe, I don't quote me on the far range of them. Um, so exceptions are made. Uh, I believe Benedict also, Benedict XVI made an exception to open the Pius XI archives before they were due as it were. So uh, in a sense, when we say what took so long, it, it really, it was sort of standard. That said, of course, there had been from the 1960s and in part in response to uh, Holkut's The Deputy, that, that fictionalized account of the, of the, of the of Pius XII and of the Vatican's policies, a desire on the part of Paul VI and the Vatican to sort of, as they see it, set the record straight. They made an exception and we began to get these, you know, these uh, select documents. Uh, I don't, I don't know when the last one was published. I think it was early 1980s. So I don't know if that answers the question. So, uh, so uh, if I could pick up on uh, something you just said in relation to another question. Uh, let's see, um, Judith Benke asks the following. Uh, will one or both of you mention the role of the deputy in exacerbating, if not actually launching, the sharp divisions on uh, Pius XII's role during the Holocaust? Seems like a good segue. Hey, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or? Well, first of all, I say hello to Judy, who uh, um, uh, uh, is, is one of the, the veterans and most knowledgeable people in, in about this whole area. Um, yeah, I think, look, clearly the, the, um, the, the play, Hochut's play, uh, struck a nerve and it struck nerves <laughs> depending on whose nerve it was and very different manners. Um, uh, I, this is not an area where I have a, a, a lot of expertise, but I think perhaps what was most important about it was in a sense, putting the question out there in, you know, publicly. Um, yeah. uh, and, um, and perhaps moving some of the focus or expanding the focus, not only on uh, uh, Germany and the Nazis, but, but expanding it wider to include other people who may not have actually been, you know, or other institutions uh, that weren't necessarily the enemy during the war, but played a role of, of, of you know, some kind of role. And, and, and I think that this focused people's attention on, on it and then, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and things sort of evolved from, from there. Um, you know, if, if, if remember it, 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 the, when the play came out, it was still a time when many survivors were not yet opening up and talking about their own experiences. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, um, I, I think that it, I mean, I don't wanna, uh, I, I think it played an important role in, um, uh, uh, forcing people to ask questions that either they hadn't thought of or perhaps they had been reluctant, reluctant to ask. And, um, uh, uh, and, and of course, there are people who will say that everything was fine until Hoffman's play came out and that that ruined everything and it's really his fault and it's all, uh, but I think it, it, it played a, 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 an important role. And, and you know, as we have seen uh, uh, recently, you know, in, in other areas, um, asking important questions about the past um, is not only something for the past, right? It's very important for the present and for the future. So. Um, we've got several questions that ask uh, about specifics of what might be revealed as you uh, work through these archives. But before some of those uh, specific questions uh, get asked, um, there's one that's a, a kind of larger meta question that I thought um, might be interesting to, uh, to answer first. So uh, Murray Watson asks, um, in a postmodern world like ours, where the concept of objective or historical truth is considered naive and almost unattainable, is it inevitable that instead of an agreed truth about Pius XII, which could contribute to healing, 
will simply end up with our truth versus your truth, which will only prolong this painful debate. Good question. Where do you think uh, that might go? Sure. I think if it's the Murray Watson I know, hello, Murray. <laughs> God, wonderful to, 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 uh, to get the question. I learned a lot about this topic uh, and certainly about the Catholic Jewish dialogue from Murray Watson. So uh, I'm, I'm humbled to be able to answer. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's a problem. I mean, whether, you know, the issue about historical truth, of course, yes, it's, it's always, that's a fraught question. It's always been. Um, and I think that the, the challenge for us is not that we're going to get a necessarily an agreed truth or an agreed version. But I, I do hope that perhaps we can, um, you know, try to maintain some um, sense of of an empirically grounded. Um, yeah, let's call. I'll, I'll go with this: an empirically grounded historical uh, interpretation and evaluation. So it may not be a truth per se, but one that's that's grounded in um, not just evidence that's that's you know unearthed from the documents, but also an understanding of the way. A religious institution works, the, um, the, the multiple factors, the multiple levels in which, uh, for example, in this case, a pope is operating. All of that requires doing a lot of hard work, right? Um, and Murray knows this really well. It requires not just doing historical research, it means doing a, doing a little bit of your theology, and a little bit about canon law, a little bit about ecclesiology. It's hard work, right? In fact, I think one of the reasons why very often historians struggle to study religion and religious institutions as actors in history, especially in the contemporary and the modern era, is that they, they don't do enough of the work of understanding the nature of a religious organization or, or a religious actor. So it may not be that we have an agreed truth, but I think we should look for, and I think that we should um, privilege, diffuse, you know, those versions that are grounded in, the, uh, in evidence that are based on sound research that make logical, conclusions and inferences, you know? Um, so it may not be a simple binary, true or not true, but I can, you know, I, I, you know, again, this is the concern that I have already with the fear of sensationalism that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's an example where I think sometimes, you know, evidence is taken out of context or stretched to fit uh, what feels at times more like a political or polemical point than a historical observation. And that's something we should be mindful of. And, and uh, I like to call it out when I see it. Yeah, I think I would just add to that, going back to what I said about uh, Pope Francis's comment about not being afraid of history being aspirational. And if it turns out that in fact, it is, you know, that we can point to that it's not just aspirational, but that um, uh, uh, the, 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 the church has uh, made a sincere and concerted effort to make sure that all the materials are available and that people have access and that when things come out, um, they, they respond in, a, you know, in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, uh, I think that that, that is, is very important. And I would also just underscore that the, the my truth or our truth versus your truth is not necessarily gonna break down along Jewish Catholic lines. Um, uh, so I think it's important that we keep that in mind as well. And so if we can get to a place where, say, uh, uh, you know, the internet, uh, you know, the International Jewish Committee on Interreligious Consultations and the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews come to a point where they can say something together about this, where, where I, again, even if uh, I think historians are going to argue over this forever, right? But but if we can come to a place where um, uh, where uh, both the, you know the those representing the Jewish community and those representing the Catholic community can say that um, uh, you know due diligence has been done, you know uh, this the the. You know, uh, we, we have studies, we've seen the evidence, we, we've examined the evidence, we've talked about the evidence. Here are things that, we're going, that we need to do to prove that, you know, to demonstrate that we're taking this seriously. I mean, I think that, that um, uh, you know, the, the, again, pardon the cliche, but, but it's, uh, you know, uh, walking the walk as it were. And, and I, to some extent, I think that that will, 
that is something I think we can expect. I'm not sure that we can, again, expect the sort of answers that, that, uh, that some are hoping for. But, but I, I think that, that um, uh, you'll, again, no pun intended, that, that if we see that the church is, is operating in good faith, and at least the organized Jewish community is responding in good faith, I think that would be a significant, uh, a significant demonstration um, that this relationship is 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 real. Can I just add really quickly, Stephen, before we move on there? Yeah, I think just to it, just to button this up, it's part of the, the the role of education, right? Of course, you know, I speak from the perspective of someone who teaches history and writes history and uh, at a university. Um, but, you know, I, I think about the conventions of the discipline, or I think about the way that we ask students to work with evidence, how they weigh arguments, we talk about logical progressions, uh, we certainly can disagree over conclusions, but there is a, a method, dare we call it a scientific method, or something approaching that kind. So not all historical accounts of Pius XII for the Vatican and the Holocaust are alike. Not all of them are as good, frankly. Um, and part of the, our mission, I think, part of a function, and David, maybe it gets back to this idea of how we get outside of the echo chambers, is to, um, you know, to, 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 to re return to some of those basic precepts about how we use evidence, how it's understood, and how you judge uh, arguments, and how you uh, filter information that is either impartial or fragmentary, or you know, misconstrued, taken out of context, all of those things, right? Which is doubly challenged given the, um, the medium in which, in which so much information is now uh, transmitted. But anyway, that's my little, my little battle cry there for uh, historical education. Um, another long question that is, um, I think, asking, uh, about the, the larger global implications of what you'll find. Um, uh, Verge is perhaps on um, asking you to speculate, but nevertheless, it, it does seem to be on the kinds of um, questions that would come up. Um, so uh, worth asking, I think. So um, Daniel Ritza says the following. I was wondering if we could pursue more the implications of the distinction that's already been made between the institutional church and the theological church or between the papacy and Catholicism more generally. So if the opening of the archive were to result in the worst possible revelations about the person of Pius XII, and if the modern day papacy proves less than willing uh, to fully acknowledge institutional culpability, what might or should that mean for ordinary Catholics? Might it be an occasion of some distancing between Catholic masses uh, and the papacy or a de-elevation of the centrality of the papacy and contemporary ecclesiology? possible outcomes. From the perspective of the Jewish community, is there any space in which ordinary Catholics might be able uh, to help make up for institutional uh, papal failures or do some of the hard work of reckoning that the Vatican may or may not be willing to do for you? David, you want me to answer the Jewish community first? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I understand the question. I'm not sure that, um, I don't think that contemporary Catholics need to make up for anything that occurred in the past. I mean, uh, unless they were directly personally involved in it. You know, I, um, uh, uh, I think it's Ezekiel who said that it used to be that the, uh, the parents ate sour grapes and the teeth of the children were set on edge, but today each person is responsible for their own sins. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that some of the most important uh, Jewish Catholic relationship um, and, and dialogue and exchange doesn't take place between my organization and the, and the commission. You know, it, it, it has to do with, well, let me just tell you a story and I, and I get a little emotional when I tell this. I live in a condo building and at the other end of my hallway uh, it is uh, uh, a, a Catholic woman in her 90s. And um, uh, her husband just recently passed away. Uh, I, you know, uh, uh, she is not a theologian or a historian, but the day after the attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh, she knocked on our door and wanted to give us hugs. Okay. Um, in, in, in uh, you know, she, she, she sent us a card for Passover this year. It was actually an Easter card. 
in which she had crossed out the word Easter and, and written in the, you know, the word Passover. And, and I'm saying this because this is a very sincere, generous, um, uh, uh, you know, selfless act of someone who's not involved, you know, uh, uh, you know, she, she uh, you know, she, she's just a Catholic person in the, in, in the pew, right? And, and, uh, you know, it was very, you know, on the, I mean, on the one hand, the card was, you know, made me laugh a little, but, but it was, a, again, a, 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 a completely selfless and, and, and generous effort, and certainly wanting to express that solidarity after, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think uh, um, uh, demonstrate um, how some of the changes I think are, are, are kind of, uh, again, pardon me for saying this, trickling down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, for many years, ADL ran a program called Bearing Witness in which we taught uh, uh, it, partnering with the USCCB, I should add, in, in, in which we uh, 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 prepared a program and, and, uh, to teach teachers in Catholic middle and high schools how to teach about Jewish Catholic relations, anti Semitism, and the Holocaust. Okay? Um, uh, the, the reactions, the, the evaluations we would get from people who participated in this about how, um, uh, not only how educational it was, but really how sort of, uh, how it changed them, their, their own uh, understanding. And, and, you know, the, the um, uh, I think one of the things that, we've, that, that we on the ADL side sometimes forgot about this, we looked at this as an educational program, but from the perspective of the USCCB, at least some of the folks who worked there said, well, that's, this is an educational program, but it's also catechesis. No, and, and um, uh, you, you know, these, these are teachers who are not only going to teach their students, but are going to bring these sensibilities into their schools, into their parishes. Um, uh, I think I just went off on this tangent a little bit, but 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 um, uh, I, I, you know I think that that um, uh, you know there's hard work on the institutional level, but then there's also and I'll I'll say one more sentence about this and then I'll stop. I I, I very much like the uh, uh, the typologies that the, in in uh, 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 dialogue and proclamation. Uh, the, the Vatican document, Dialogue and Proclamation, which talks about four types of, of, of interreligious dialogue. You know, there is the, uh, you know, there's sort of the academic theological dialogue, which is what we tend to think about as being interreligious dialogue. But then there's the dialogue of shared experience. You know, if you go to a wedding in a church you've never been before, you go to a bar mitzvah, there's the dialogue of, of, of just living together you know, being, being neighbors. And then there's the dialogue of action, right? Sort of uh, uh, social justice work. Um, uh, I, I think these are all uh, places where some of this hard work takes place, even if it's not explicit. You know, even if the topic is not, we are, I'm a Jew and you're a Catholic and we need to talk about 2000 years of history, but rather, I'm a Jew. We're, we're Catholic. We live in this in this community together. Um, what can we do to make our community better? You know, even so, it, it takes place on all levels. I don't know if that was helpful or again me going off somewhere. Powerful. It's very very powerful. Thank you, David. Dr. Ventresca, would you uh, care to add anything on that question? Uh, yeah, I mean, so much, especially uh, again, after, given David's powerful um, uh, reflections there. Yeah, just I think the question was about institutional. Um, what, I, if I got the last part of it, what what it sounds like? What if what do we do if the Vatican doesn't doesn't deliver in this case, or is that that kind of where? Yeah, well, uh, the question is asking, uh, you know, if the worst possible light comes. Uh, sure. Uh, what to make of that, uh, given the distinction that you made between uh, the institutional and the theological church? Um, what then might be the, uh, the appropriate response? I mean, I think it, it depends on one's 
one's perspective or one, where one stands. I mean, my work, what I'm going to do is the work of the historian. Um, and so uh, what I find, I find. Again, I understand that archives by their nature are organized, uh, you know, th th they reveal much, but they also conceal. And, and so one has to always be mindful of the limitations of those sources, but I do it sort of, if you will, fearlessly. Um, we, we let the evidence speak, we draw the conclusions that we can draw. Um, you know, I think what David's referring to, I think what, what the, the, the reflection reminds us of is that we have, each of us in a sense, we have to lower our gaze from that institutional level, which is important and powerful. But ultimately the question, ultimately, how do we, how do things filter down to the level of social relations uh, where people live in community um, and, uh, and doing the work that we do whatever that may be, if it's education, if it's the work of the historian, if it's the work of, of interfaith relations and dialogue, um, that the relational, the, 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 the world of social relations is really in some sense is the most important part of the work as it were, right? I, I guess, if, 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 maybe I've, if I hope I've not avoided the question, it sounds like, but it, you know, will the Vatican kind of um, sort of come to terms? Will there be a reckoning? And that's something of course one can't really uh, uh, predict, um, but it doesn't in a sense matter, I think. What matters is that people uh, of good conscience uh, do the work, um, you know, share what they find, do it uh, without fear of any kind of, of recrimination, uh, and I certainly feel free uh, to, to say what I want to say and do the work that I want to do. Um, I don't make, you know, the, the institutional church and the theological, that distinction I don't think is one that necessarily Catholics uh, make um, for, for various reasons. But uh, I'll just say it again, that I think that it's incumbent on all people uh, in the church um, to take seriously that, that admonition of, you know, loving the truth, uh, the truth shall make you free and, and practicing it. So as with other instances, I think that uh, we, we, uh, we, we do the work and we let it speak for itself. I think we might have time for maybe one more question. We're coming up on uh, 8.30. Those are great questions. Um, I think uh, we'll ask just uh, for um, curiosity's sake. Uh, so um, uh, one of our audience members asks, early on, what was Pius XII's relationship to Mussolini? Uh, any indicators there as to uh, um, uh, Pius XII's view of fascism and Nazism. Uh, Shall I take that in? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, the only thing that I would do there, I believe is that um, there's a book about that, about uh, uh, the Pope and Mussolini. Uh, is that David Kurtzer's book? David, yeah, David Kurtzer's book, yeah. And it's about, that's about Pius XI. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so, yeah, um, practice sort of short answer is that Pacelli himself, the future Pius XII, was in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, so that the early period of the fascist uh, experience in Italy was not one that he had any uh, interaction with. Of course, he then becomes Secretary of State. He serves under Pius XII. So it's in the 1930s that you begin to see um, his formal uh, engagement with, uh, with Mussolini's Italy. Uh, I've got so much I could say about this. So is the question about his views on fascism and Nazism? You know, again, um, <laughs> I mean, I've, and I've written about it. Uh, you know, P P Pius XII, like his predecessor, Pius XI, they were, I think, in some senses, um, really committed to a view of church-state relations. And this probably reflected his diplomatic trainings and his diplomatic um, predisposition. That it didn't in a sense matter what the ideology was, what the, the, the regime stood for. What mattered was that, that the, uh, the church could find a way of living with that. A modus vivendi, in fact, was a phrase that was used in both general common parlance, but also a technical term, right? So I think his approach was always to find the path of conciliation, right? Uh, by the way, his brother was someone who helped negotiate the, the accords that create Vatican City. So the Pacelli family has a history of conciliating with and reconciling with uh, the state. It did it before fascism, it does it during fascism. Um, now that can look like it's, it's uh, support for fascism, but I would, wouldn't go that far. Um, because I think that there was always, for someone like Pius XII, 
a deep suspicion of, a rejection of some of the obvious excessive nationalism and even some of the overt racism of fascism and Nazism. But I wouldn't go so far again as to su su suggest he was some kind of anti-fascist in, 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 in the making, because he wasn't. I think what he always sought was to find a way of accommodating, conciliating. Uh, you know, I've used the analogy uh, before that, um, and this was true in the 1930s as, as relations between both fascist Italy and Nazi Germany with the Vatican begin to worsen. And at this point, Pius XI is aging and Pius XII, of course, is, is Secretary of State about to be elected. He sort of used the analogy of sort of steering the ship away from the iceberg, if you will, right? He always saw open confrontation with, with the, the, the fascist regimes as an iceberg, if you will. If I may, can I use that analogy? Um, and so do what you can to avoid it because no good will come to anyone, to the church institutionally, to individuals. Um, now the question always is, so I'm fairly, I'm fairly confident giving you that historical description. The question though is how do you judge that? How do you judge it in terms of um, uh, moral witness? How do you judge it in terms of prophetic witness? How do you judge it in terms of its success on a political or diplomatic level? Because it kind of fails in a way, right? The fascist regimes become inexorably more radical. And in many a ways, each of his objectives fails. So there are all of these different layers of judgment, I guess, right? Historical, but also inevitably moral and ethical. And um, I'll leave, I'll ask the question, right? I mean, I have my own views about, about how you judge all of that. So it was, it was again, it's an ambiguous, contradictory picture. All right, well, Rabbi Sandmel and Professor Ventresca, thank you for le letting us listen in on your conversation uh, this evening. I think um, one of the things that uh, you, you've shown us is the importance of open and honest dialogue about uh, these issues and their many dimensions uh, and sort of recognizing our, our, our place within our, our own sort of personal places. Um, and relationship to these issues. So I thank you for that. I thank you. I thank the um, all of you who joined us uh, this evening. Um, and um, um, as I said at the beginning, if you are uh, interested in being on our mailing list, uh, you can send me uh, an email at uh, a urbano uh, at providence.edu. Um, and you can also um, follow us on Twitter at Jews Catholics PC. And um, the recording of tonight's event will be going up on our website, uh, Jews.Catholic, uh, wait a minute, yeah, dot pro, no, Jews, de, no, Jewish-Catholic.Providence.edu. That's where we are. Uh, and you can also, you can also find uh, our past events uh, there uh, as well for the viewing. So thank you all again. Um, this conversation will continue. We look forward to, to hearing more about um, what the I archives um, reveal. I hate to use that word, right? Because I go back, it goes back to that sort of secretive uh, yield, right? What, 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 what the, the research will yield uh, and how that will affect um, the dialogue uh, in the future. Uh, so thank you again. Thanks uh, to Stephen and uh, for, uh, to everyone. So have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.